Namaskar and uh, very good morning to you all. My name is Rajan Pradhan and I'm Senior Program Officer in uh, Sikkim State Envis Hub, Forest and Environment Department, Government of Sikkim. I feel privileged and honored to be your host and moderator for the inaugural session for today's webinar, which is on the topic mainstreaming climate change into development policies and strategies. This webinar uh, is being organized uh, as a part of Ek Bharat Sesta Bharat program by the Environmental Information System, that is ENVIS, a scheme under Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, uh, with the objective of enhancing interaction and uh, promoting mutual understanding between different states, reason on issues of climate change, and brainstorm ourselves with climate change adaptations with uh, sustainable policies and strategies to make the SDG goals 2030 a reality. So under this Ek Bharat Sesta Bharat initiative, Sikkim State has been paired with Delhi State, and this webinar is a production of joint collaboration of Sikkim Envis Hub Forest and Environment Department and our Envis resource partner on renewable energy and climate change hosted at Terry, New Delhi. We would also like to commemorate this event under the banner of Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav, celebrating 75 years of India's independence, and also. Today, 21st March, being an important environment calendar day of celebrating International Day of Forest with the theme Forest and Sustainable Production and Consumption, which is very much aligned with the SDG goal number 12, which is responsible consumption and uh, production. We would like to mark this webinar as a way of celebrating this International Day of Environmental Importance as well. Uh, so we have divide this webinar into an inaugural session in which we have three speakers and then we'll have proceed with the technical session in which we have three speakers uh, to quickly introduce the speakers for the inaugural session we have miss kusum gurung joint director of forest who is looking after envis as a co-coordinator for sikkim state envis hub and she is also a joint director of state pollution control board forest and environment department government of sikkim she will be presenting the overview of the program then we'll have speaker from Ministry of Environment and Forest, Ms. Sutanuka Sarkar, Assistant Director, Economic Division, also looking after Envis scheme in the ministry. So we'll be speaking on the overview about Envis scheme. Then we have our respected speaker, a very senior professor, Dr. Vinod Kesarma, uh, from uh, IAPA, Indian Institute of uh, Public Administration from New Delhi. He is also a vice chairman of Sikkim State Disaster Management Authority for Government of Sikkim. And Dr. Vinod Kesarma is also a member of Science, Technology and Innovation Policy for Government of India. He'll be speaking on the climate change induced disaster and its management plan in Sikkim. Then we'll follow up with the technical session, which will be moderated by um, our colleague, Ms. Pallavi Singh. She is the Senior Program Officer at Terry and Biss Resource Partner at New Delhi. We'll have three speakers in the technical session. The first speaker would be uh, Mr. Dhiren Gopal Sestra, who is the Director of State Remote Sensing Application Center at Science and Technology Department, Government of Sikkim. He will be speaking on the issues and challenges in regard to Sikkim State Climate Action Plan. Then we have speaker, a reputed scientist, Dr. Bharat Kumar Pradhan. He is a scientific associate from Sikkim State Biodiversity Board, also a member of IUCN and a community leader from Friends for Future International. He will be speak, uh, deliberating on the challenges and complexities of mainstreaming climate change into developmental activities. Then we have another respected speaker, Ms. Suruchi Bhadwal, a senior fellow and director from Terry, looking after earth science and climate change. She will be deliberating on, on the understanding and the linkages between climate change and state developmental goals, as well as understanding the governmental, institutional, and political context and needs. Then we'll have a summing up of the interactive, uh, with the interactive session, which will be coordinated by Dr. P.K. Bhattacharya, the Senior Fellow and uh, Associate Director, also the ENVIS Coordinator for ENVIS Resource Partner. So to proceed with the webinar, I would firstly like to welcome and request Ms. Kusum Guru, Joint Director of Forest, uh, looking after ENVIS as a co-coordinator in Sikkim and also a Joint Director for State Pollution Control Board, Forest and Environment Department, Government of Sikkim, to give uh, the formal welcome address and the overview of the program. Over to you, madam, please. Thank you. Thank you, Rajan. Uh, namaskar. A very good morning to all. On behalf of uh, Sikkim Envisa, Forest and Environment Department, 
Uh, I extend a warm welcome to all the distinguished speakers from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Sikkim State Disaster Management Authority, Government of Sikkim, Science and Technology Department, State Biodiversity Board on the Forest and Environment Department, and this resource partner, Terry, to this webinar on mainstreaming climate change into development policies and strategies today. We also extend warm welcome to all our participants today, that is, officers from all the land departments, accommodations, heads of schools, green teachers, researchers, scholars, field functionaries, as well as officers from our own uh, forest and environment department. Today, we also celebrate uh, International Day of Forest, and we all know that forest plays a major role in carbon sequestration and climate change. Uh, today's webinar, that is uh, development of policies and strategies that will help us reduce climate risk, increase resilience, increase adaptation, uh, is the key point that we shall deliberate upon in today's webinar. We also expect a good interactive session today. And uh, best wishes to all the uh, participants as well as the distinguished speakers. Thank you. Over to Rajin. Yeah, thank you, madam. That was uh, Ms. Kusum Gurung, Joint Director of Forest, for giving the overview of the program. As we speak, uh, we have 35 participants. Uh, uh, Sikkim being a Himalayan state, uh, we have all we are all uh, mostly face the internet issues, and we have been getting calls in between from the other parts of uh, the remote parts of the state, saying that they are having technical issues, but yet they are trying to join. So hopefully, we'll have more participants uh, during the uh, technical session. And now I would like to request and welcome uh, Ms. Sutanuka Sarkar, Madam, the Ad Assistant Director from Ministry of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. To kindly present the overview of our in this scheme. Over to you, Madam, please. Firstly, good, uh, very good morning, everyone. I'll just take some time and uh, upload the PPT here, share. I hope it's visible. Yes, ma'am, it's visible. It's visible. So, a uh, very uh, good morning to everyone here, and. Uh -huh. thank inviting me today on this uh, webinar on mainstreaming climate change into development policies and strategies conducted by Terry Envis uh, RP and Sikkim Envis Hub. So now without wasting much time, I'd like to move on to briefing about our scheme uh, that is Envis. Uh, which is Madam, a me, uh, uh, Madam I, I, can you put, the, put it in the slideshow? Okay, sure. Is it better now? Fine. Yes, better. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, I'll be briefing a little about our uh, scheme uh, in the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, that is ENVIS. Now, Environmental Information uh, System, a brief overview on that is that the it was initially, uh, it started in 1983 and initially it was under the umbrella scheme of environmental awareness, protection, monitoring. And then as per uh, the feedback from then uh, uh, Minister of Environment, Forest and Climate Change back in 2017-18, it was then shifted to the umbrella scheme of decision support system for environmental awareness, policy planning and outcome evaluation. So basically the mandate of our scheme is that we have uh, the basic mandate is to collect, collate, uh, store, retrieve and disseminate the, uh, information on various environmental themes. And for this, uh, we have a de decentralized network of 60 Envis centers, of which 26 are Envis hubs, who are uh, hosted by Environment Forest Department of State Governments and UT Administrations, and 34 Envis RPs, who are uh, institutes of professional ex uh, excellence uh, related to uh, governmental or non-governmental organizations, and have a they have a thematic mandate as well. Now. There are three components of our scheme, namely uh, knowledge products. Second is uh, green skilling development program. And third is ISBID database. That is India state level basic environmental information database. So in knowledge products, uh, the thematic centers, or we can say NVIS RPs uh, 
have a mandate to do like uh, take out uh, reports on thema uh, thematic reports, documentaries and videos. The newsletters are brought out and also they develop some of them develop mobile apps, handbooks, various informational kits like educational kits, as you can see in this slide. These are done in the knowledge product segment. Then moving on to the most uh, important, significant of we may say the sort of, uh, like the most highlighted part of our scheme that is green skill development program. Here, basically, it, uh, it within the uh, uh, ages of green skill development program, our aim was to improve the livelihood opportunities through skilling in green sector. That is wildlife, forestry, and various other components of the green sector. And it has so far played an instrumental role in enabling India's youth to get gainful employment and self-employment in the green sector of uh, forest and wildlife. So it has actually played a very good role as of now. Now it's, I'll uh, be talking about the GSDP mechanism, like what are the components within the GSDP? So the target group that we have is environmental enthusiasts or we can say unemployed youth who are actually uh, looking to get employment but uh, have uh, just a vocational education till level uh, class 11 or 12 or dropouts or uh, budding entrepreneurs and even some students who are aspiring to have a ca uh, career in the green sector or environment sector. Then the GSDP course curriculum is approved by National uh, uh, Council of Vocational Education and Training, and it is as per National Skill Qualification Framework. The training is basically uh, imparted by our Envis hubs and RPs, and as a result of the training, the workforce that we have, like the skilled individuals, are termed as the green skilled workforce or green workforce. Now, the employment opportunities that we have for them is of three uh, in three parts. That is first, uh, there is also a facility of wage employment where they can get employment in pollution control boards, wildlife sanctuaries, work as guides in zoos, then ecotourism centers and uh, local body. And then uh, we have green entrepreneurs or employment startups or uh, self-help groups. So some budding entrepreneurs can also uh, start uh, have their own startups in the green sector. Then we can also have another type of um, employment prospect here. That is, some of the skilled individuals become master trainers. That is, in consequently, when other pro, uh, other GSDP courses are conducted after their uh, course is finished, they can also some individuals or uh, skilled individuals who do really well can become master trainers and train in the subsequent courses. Now, in this, I'll uh, talk a bit about GSDP, uh, GSDP's inception, how uh, the idea was formulated. So, under the ongoing ENVI scheme, uh, the Green Skill Development Program was launched in 2017 on a pilot basis. Because there was a lot of, there has been lately a lot of uh, talk about uh, tra green transition or uh, betterment of uh, as in skilling of people in green sectors so there uh, that that's where the idea was formed and uh, the green skilling development program uh, during its launch uh, on a pilot basis it was conducted at 10 locations spread over nine geographic regions now because the pilot was a huge success the program was expanded or extended to a pan india level in 2018-19 and uh, after various consultation meetings uh, that was held with uh, National Council of Vocational Education and Training, that is a uh, part of MSD. Uh, uh, curriculum of GSDP courses were decided and also it was standardized as per NSQF framework, that is the National uh, Skill Qualification Framework by MSD. And thereafter, GSDP programs were conducted through the network of NVIS hubs and RPs. And state, uh, it's very, uh, we are very happy to say that 25 GSDP courses have been uh, so far approved by NCVET. Now, uh, when we see at the numbers, the placement status or number of uh, uh, trainees, uh, number of people uh, who have been trained, the, we are very, it's very enthralling to look at the statistics. So as we can see uh, uh, around 6,178, uh, people have been skilled and 2,404 uh, number of uh, skilled people have been placed till now. 
Now, 40% of total candidates have found gainful employment uh, post the GSDP program, and of which 76% of case candidates are employed uh, in the relevant uh, field and sectors. Now, the placement analysis, if we see at the bottom end graphs of category wise placement of GSDP and gender wise placement of GSDP, so this shows that we have touched upon the left on the, uh, the bar graph on the left and shows that we have indeed touched upon the lives of marginalized section. So this is something which shows that GSDP has somewhere or other uh, enabled empowerment of people in the uh, especially uh, that of underprivileged people. And in the gender wise placement of GSDP, we can see that uh, quite a good number of females have participated in the program. And now when we see, uh, see that the female labor force participation rate is so low and somewhere or other when GSDP brings in this number. So it's really enthralling to see that uh, uh, that it bodes well for the gender relations. Now. Uh, the Greenfield Development Program has got a lot of appreciation and recognition Please from sir. various state governments, uh, like uh, from Chief Secretary of Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, they have the Ministry of Environment Don't for listen. expanding GDP course in the okay, states. Yes. There was a letter from Special Secretary of Government of Orissa to request uh, who have requested MOFCC for additional GSDP courses in the state. And there was a letter from APCCF of uh, engagement of GSDP trained candidate at Telangana. So the, uh, there are many such examples. Now, uh, I would like to say that uh, we have a long association with Terry Envis RP and Sikkim Envis Hub, and they have been at the forefront in complementing our efforts when it comes to supporting the agenda of uh, transition to green economy. And uh, they have conducted various courses on GSDP, like the bamboo crops, then uh, on solar energy and forest fire management while beekeeping. Lastly, I'd like to say, uh, since the webinar is on mainstreaming climate change uh, into development policies, so there's a lot of talk about this mainstreaming and climate change into development policies or for green transition to uh, a transition to green economy. But I, what I think is very important and a crucial aspect is proper alignment of skills, environment, infrastructure and policies for this. And somewhere or other, it makes us very happy that somewhere or other we are contributing to this transition to green economy via our skill development program and definitely Envis hubs and RPs have been complementing our efforts in a very good way and thank you so much. That's all that I have to say. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, that was Ms. Sutanuka Sarkar, Assistant Director from uh, Economic Division in the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, looking after Envis scheme. Madam has uh, very well uh, portrayed about the ENVIS scheme, different activities, and uh, has presented that ENVIS is one of the main infrastructure, uh, the key infrastructure for uh, taking up global action, local action for global climate change. Now, we'll have an inaugural address uh, on climate change induced disaster and its management plan in Sikkim from our very respected senior professor, sir, Dr. Vinod K. Sarma, sir. So I would like to request sir to kindly Present the inaugural address, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Pradhan. Uh, uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are audible. Okay, thank you. Audible. Thank you. Madam uh, Kusum Gurungji and uh, the Assistant Director from uh, Ministry of Environment and Forest, Ms. Uh, Sutan, Sutanuka Sarkar, and uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, Terry, uh, Professor P.K. Bhattacharya ji, Ms. Pallavi, my very good colleague, you know, Thiren Shrestha ji, and other officers of uh, government of Sikkim who are uh, attending this program, which is supposed to be uh, it's a very important initiative and very timely initiative by ANVIS. In fact, as uh, Ms. Sarkar was saying, this is a very important government initiative 
and uh, it is giving fruits you know basically it is to create awareness you know in the whole country and uh, when we have umbrella act environment protection act you know in 1987 after that you know we decided that this awareness should go to each and every part of the country and today it is uh, you know this webinar is for sikkim which is a very beautiful state one of very smallest uh, you know state of the country but uh, exemplary state i should say because in environment sector we can say that sikkim is one of the model state so the whole himalaya will be affected by climate change and uh, the impact will be there in the entire country but uh, sikkim will be very much affected we are already seeing that the number of rainy days are decreasing we are having intense rainfall the number of landslides etc though we are having more than 56% forest cover in the sikkim but still you see that uh, these uh, events like landslides etc which are induced by intense rain this is happening one more thing you know which is happening in the state that uh, because we have a small villages and all these villages we are facing the acute water problem though the rainfall is more than 300 cm but still our villages are uh, there is a scarcity of water and reason is that the entire water is going to river tista and uh, you know the riverlets and ultimately not available because of steep slopes and wherever you know so government of sikkim has uh, done a remarkable thing and that is a very good uh, example of climate change adaptation that that this is dhara vikas and i think dhiren will definitely mention it in his presentation he is one of the very knowledgeable person in the state working on climate change he is working since you know two decades and uh, uh, done remarkable scientific work you know in this state he is the best person you know to tell you that uh, how the climate change impact is visible and he will show it you know with the help of his slides in which he will show that how our glaciers are affected how glacial lakes are affected and uh, this is uh, Uh, really a, a remarkable thing which is being done in uh, in sikkim you know database is having its own importance and uh, we are maintaining our database in case you come to sikkim you will be very happy that department of science and technology is a very small department but they are having very good excellent database Uh, they are recording having information about each and every glacier about our forest cover about our you know uh, lakes water any water body in in the sikkim including glacial lakes so all these things you know i think this you will see in the after inauguration i think the technical session which is organized by terry this is very useful and i am sure that 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 will be eye opening as far as biodiversity and all these things are concerned which are again affected by climate change definitely you know that this will be discussed and uh, uh, that's why i am saying that sikkim is one state you know where in each and every area i am not saying it because i am vice chair of sikkim state disaster management authority or i am having you know this responsibility but i have observed that this state when 
when we talk about climate change, when we talk about biodiversity, when we talk about the climate change adaptation, I think Sikkim is one state from where we can have or we can develop many case studies in water sector, in forest sector, in biodiversity sector, in community participation, in role of panchayats. I think this is one state which is doing great thing. My friends, you know, in uh, Terry Envis, they asked me to give a brief overview. So I have prepared a small presentation and I am encouraged by Madam Sarkar, you know, she presented very well that what government of India, you know, Ministry of Environment and Forest, how this scheme is. So she gave a beautiful presentation. I will, uh, uh, with the, uh, your permission, I would also like to share, you know, one very small presentation, which may be useful, you know, to the participants. This is, uh, uh, yeah, this is climate change and disaster risk reduction in Sikkim. Is it uh, visible, uh, Yes, yes. yes sir, visible. Okay. Yes, visible, sir. Sir, you can put it in the slideshow. I will do that. Bigger show, yes. I will do it. Yeah. Yes, coming. Thank you. And now it's gone back. Uh, now it's okay, sir. So now the uh, you you know about the state and uh, very beautiful state, very scenic. You go to any part of the Sikkim, it is not only north, south. I think any part that is a attraction, you know, for tourists. And this is giving us a big uh, problem also. It's an organic state, the first organic state in the country. And uh, uh, from all over the country, and not only from our country, but from other country also, I mean, uh, from Japan, from other neighboring countries, people used to come for seeing so many things, you know, in Sikkim. Not only the natural beauty, but how they are maintaining this beautiful state. And that's why sometimes we see this kind of scenes that the tourists, you know, they chalk our roads, etc., and cause, you know, some other problem. This is a new threat, you know, which climate change, we are seeing it, you know, and it is a threat to the government, to the corporate sector, to NGOs, to local communities, and uh, uh, we are facing it, you know, we are, uh, we are also, we means the Sikkimis, Sikkim, Sikkim government, as well as the population, we are also facing the brunt of climate change, and uh, we, uh, we can see the, you know, impact on biodiversity. Uh, we can see the impact on natural resources, society uh, in the Himalayan region. And uh, uh, this is visible nowadays, you know, in Sikkim. You know that it is a fragile ecological system and very sensitive to climate change. And uh, uh, when you go to any Guru Dogmar or any other place, you know, as a tourist, you will see the impact and uh, uh, that we will, uh, you will see uh, more clearly when my colleagues will give a detailed picture of Sikkim. And uh, so the climate change impact is uh, now uh, visible and uh, the threats in form of uh, flash floods, in form of uh, you know, uh, disappearing of some of the species in uh, in in uh, in some regions, maybe alpine species or others. I have taken it, you know, from all from Sikkim, uh, you know, uh, government records. So you can. This is all reliable information which we are giving to you, and uh, this is affecting our ecological system. Uh, our uh, whole ecological system and affecting our livelihood also nowadays. Then at the same time, the Sikkim is very sensitive state and it, it is example of good governance also. 
and there are many ma major uh, initiatives which is taken by the state government and we have sikkim state council of climate change which was set up you know earlier the nodal department is science and technology and uh, it has constituted glacier and climate change commission also because we are having you know more than 54 glaciers in this state and uh, uh, there are five six lakes which are increasing in size donakh lake i think my friend dhiren will definitely mention you know they have done remarkable job in releasing water of Lonak Lake in last two, three years. The commissioning of uh, micro level climate change vulnerability assessment, this is being done. We have records, we have, you know, pictures of each and every area. And we are thankful to space uh, research, which are providing us information, uh, you know, regu on regular basis. Then uh, official, we have officially we have banned you know grazing and protected areas in the protected areas, and uh, the official state policy is banning green forest for construction also. So I think these are some of the things which are you will not see in many states. In Himalayan states, I think overgrazing all these things which are causing problem and landslide etc i think this is a must and this initiative is already been taken i think the state action plan you know on climate change and uh, we were together three years back the former secretary ministry of environment and forest was there and he was appreciating our uh, you know the state action plan uh, of sikkim and he was mentioning that this is one plan which is practical, which is uh, not ignoring, you know, any fact. And it, it is a very, very good plan, you know, in his view. And I really, you know, credit Ministry of uh, Department of Science and Technology for this thing. They are upgrading it every year, every time. And uh, the vulnerability assessment as I told you that the database and some of the things will be clear to you in the afternoon when Dhiren will give a very detailed presentation to you. This, uh, our action plan is more heavy. It is saying more, you know, on adaptation than the mitigation. But now we have started both. We are working on adaptation as well as we are working on mitigation. And I think Lonakh Lake experiment this is a very good example of mitigation then this infrastructure i think we are going to start government with the help of government of india uh, this uh, uh, you know disaster resilient infrastructure which is a, a program international program started by honorable prime minister and uh, Earlier, we were having only two partners, India and Britain, but now about 40 countries have joined this. And Sikkim, as a pilot project, we are going to start from next month. And uh, we are working on it because we are very vulnerable. Our roads are vulnerable. Our electric system is vulnerable. Our communication system is vulnerable. And because the natural disasters and particularly landslides, floods, they disturb the whole thing. So we are more vulnerable, you know, for the infrastructure and we are doing it. And you will see that, you know, very soon, uh, whatever we will do, as we have done after 2011 earthquake, that the entire building construction by the government, including our secretariat, it is earthquake resistant. So all these buildings which government is making, they are all disaster resilient. And this is a very good initiative by the government of Sikkim. So disaster preparedness, you know, this is our priority. And I think in climate change, when we are talking climate change, then definitely the frequency of disasters the impact of disasters will increase and definitely we will have to 
strengthen our preparedness mitigation system before disaster what can we do i am very happy to tell you that we are having a very good network with the universities not only from sikkim but amrita university from coimbatore they are also helping us in giving a sort of landslide warning system and they are developing a community based you know warning system for landslide and uh, this is working very well and uh, so i think sikkim there is one good thing which you will see that government academic institution we want to work together and uh, this is one very important thing which uh, uh, we are doing these are you know in case you see the table and some of the student which which have joined this thing this table is very good for them this is on one side we are we have given the risk due to climate change it may be rainfall it may be runoff area it may be landslides it may be flooding it may be drought it may be glacial lakes and then the impact areas you know uh, in sikkim due to climate risk you know what will be affected by this for example in case the intensity of rainfall and surface runoff is increased definitely it will be having impact on our forest it will be having impact on our grassland on our agriculture on our horticulture and landslide etc etc that will be uh, affecting our tourism as you are seeing that when there is a rainy season we get minimum you know tourism in sikkim it is affected badly similarly risk of flooding then loss of life it is there then there will be more pressure on dams it is on uh, impact is on on agriculture and horticulture and definitely tourism is our main industry that will also be affected risk of drought and you will be surprised that i mean where there is rainfall more than 300 cm but still we have drought like situations where our animal life agriculture our rivers etc will be at risk so this, this this is a very good comparison you know which we have done as i told you that sikkim is you know you can have many many good case studies and i think this experiment of reviving springs dhara vikas i think this program is appreciated all over the country this is started in other states also we are giving training to them and thank you for you know department of rural development and management they are doing wonderful job and they got appreciation from central government they got award on this thing because we have regenerated more than 4000 springs you know in sikkim we have many case studies organic this is you know already that sikkim is the only organic state in the country though uttarakhand and many other state they have started working on it on pilot basis now government of india they have started a program that in ganga namami gange on both side of the river you know they will be having organic farming i think it's a very good program and that will be the pollution in river will be minimized and this will promote you know growth of organic uh, material you know in the country and uh, it will be having you know uh, these pilot projects definitely uh, this will be in the five states but later on definitely all other states will take note of it and they will also start working on organic farming <clears throat> i will conclude i will say that sikkim government you know you, you take any uh, department i think because the whole webinar today it is on mainstreaming and i think again i will say that sikkim is a very good example for that you, it may be agriculture horticulture livestock so it is not only agriculture ministry which is doing i think each and every ministry it may be irrigation it may be other each and every department is taking part 
when there is a water scarcity water security i think the dhara vikas program is a very good example of you know combined effort, effort of uh, many departments in which rural development was there forest department was there science and technology was there irrigation was there agriculture was there and then you know they could do that great job and this is these, these are the examples that in climate change i think this when we are talking about mainstreaming this will not be done by saying but you will have to do it and you can take this lead from sikkim this is a very very good example when there is anything about forest wildlife ecotourism i mean many you know it is forest department which help it is tourism department it is all the departments you know they work together and this is mainstream urban and rural habit habitat i gave you example of you know rural housing that how each and every body you know help them to make the disaster resilient infrastructure after the earthquake energy efficiency i think uh, this uh, you know it that this sikkim is very very sensitive about the energy uh, they are installing the led lights etc and there are many initiatives which is taken by the state government glacier monitoring i will not touch it because my uh, very competent colleague will talk about this so i will not i will just finish it up that friends today we are having three things you know one thing is paris agreement which we are all aware now the sixth report of ipcc which has come this is saying that don't wait for you know this 1.5 or 2 below 2 degree celsius you will see that very soon you know you will be having this much and war which is uh, this war of ukraine and russia this has you will see the impact on climate and how much energy you know every day how much temperature raise is there in that region you will see the impact very soon and scientists will work on it and they will tell you that paris you will have to revise all this data so now i think we should be more conscious about it sustainable development goal again from 15 to 30 and we will uh, this is all talking about sustainable development and how to achieve it and if you are not considering if you are not mainstreaming climate change how you will achieve sustainable development then sindey framework and sindey framework is about disaster risk reduction and we are all signatory india is signatory to all actually so we will have to work you know together on all the three uh, on paris agreement you know which we have signed on agenda uh, 2030 of sustainable development goals and we are very happy to say that sikkim in among the small states i think we are leader leader and uh, we should maintain our position and Uh, we should become example you know in the country that how uh, we we are maintaining you know good sdgs and then the sindey framework and i think the uh, ssdma sikkim state disaster management authority uh, i think this is giving uh, very very good results and in terms of in in words of honorable prime minister of india that this state is model state in disaster risk reduction so i think this these words you know of prime minister will give a lot of encourage you know encouragement to us and we will work in this area and we are working together actually with science and technology on climate change as well as in risk reduction because the impact of climate change is visible uh, in the state and we are revising we are adding you know every year in the state action plan something and now maybe uh, this is the time because now it is 10 years back we, when we prepared this i think we will work together and maybe dhiren ji and we will work on revising this state plan in fact every year we will have to revise it now because 
seeing the impact of climate change, this one-time document will not work. We will have to prioritize our action. We will have to uh, forging, you know, partnerships with others, maybe with UN agencies, maybe with F now FAO is uh, trying to work with us, and uh, so we will work with United UN, UN agencies, FAO, etc. We are making a state disaster management plan, and we are linking it with development in the state knowledge management system. You know, center on climate change. This uh, needs to be set up in the state, and we will work on all, all these things soon uh, because we have very good coordination actually with the uh, science and technology. Uh, friends, as I told you, that there are many things which we will uh, you will see uh, after my presentation and by the officers who know much more than me in climate change and. Uh, uh, the state government actions, etc. Now, I will just finish in saying that we have few things, you know, uh, about the way forward. And way forward is that disaster risk reduction. Actually, my uh, as uh, my topic given by Professor Bhattacharya, that with climate change, the impact of climate change can be minimized. You know, in case there is, we reduce risk. And as I told you that Sikkim state is very conscious about it. We are involving Panchayati Raj. We are giving training up to the grassroots level. Our all officers are being trained, you know, in this production. And SSDMA is one of very, very competent and uh, working on this thing. We are having a project on climate finance. And we are preparing a big project with science and technology, which will be funded by uh, Green Climate Fund. And uh, we are working on loss and damage. We are working with the local com communities on biodiversity, et cetera. And uh, so the traditional knowledge, wisdom, you know, which we are having, that should be revived. And Sikkim is having so many traditional agriculture, agroecological things which should be documented and can be a case study, you know, for other states. Information sharing, you know, this is uh, uh, very important and we are doing it. Every year we do one or two national level workshop. You'll be very happy to know that National Disaster Management Authority, they have announced that they are going to do, they, they are going to have a, uh, you know, mountain state conclave very soon in Sikkim in which they will discuss this climate change and disaster risk reduction. And uh, that will be a very, very good initiative of NDM. Agriculture, I think there is no need to tell you that we are very, uh, I mean, very, very good, very competent secretary nowadays. And we are very conscious about sustainability of our organic farming and we are working on it we have uh, and, you know, these are some of the references links from where i have taken these information to give it to share it with you i will give it to the pallavi in case she is interested and want to share with other participants in case they want uh, i stop uh, this uh, sharing of uh, this presentation and in case there is any question i will be very happy because many students have also joined and there are many students who may not be from sikkim and uh, for them in case there is any question i will be very happy to answer that over to you mr pradhan <clears throat> thank you sir thank you sir for your very detailed and insightful presentation sir uh, that was dr vinod K. Sarma, Senior Professor from Disaster Management and Consultant at Indian Institute of Public Administration. He is also a Vice Chairman of Sikkim State Disaster Management Authority for Government of Sikkim. And also to mention to all the viewers, he is also a member of Science, Technology and Innovation Policy for Government of India. Thank you, sir, for uh, highlighting Sikkim as a model state in the country amongst the Himalayan state as well as for Pan-India 
in environmental forefront. Nevertheless, the issues that you have raised about global climate change impacting Sikkim is very visible. And uh, thank you for your reflections and uh, recommendations you have made on the Sikkim State Action Plan and Climate Change. Hopefully, uh, those aspects will be covered as you have rightly mentioned by Dhirid Sister Sir from Science and Technology. And uh, with this, we come to the end of the inaugural session. Uh, I would like to, uh, on behalf of Sikkim Envis Hub and Terry Envis RP, I would like to thank all the speakers during the inaugural session, Mr. Kanuka Sarkar, Assistant Director. Uh, she has just left the meeting because of her uh, uh, other meetings in the ministry. Thank you, Ms. Kusum Gurung, our Joint Director from uh, Government of Sikkim. Now we will proceed with the technical session, uh, which is on the topic of this uh, day's webinar. And this uh, technical session uh, will be moderated by Ms. Pallavi Singh. And uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Vinod uh, Sir was mentioning about some questions, I think we'll take up questions uh, in the last part of this webinar in which uh, we have an interactive and summing up session which will be coordinated by Dr. P.K. Bhattacharya. So over to you, Ms. Pallavi Singh. So kindly proceed with the technical session, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Rajin. Uh, thank you all the speakers for such an insightful uh, presentation and uh, information about the NVS, about GSDP, about the state Sikkim. Thank you, uh, Madam. So we will now proceed to the next technical session on mainstreaming climate change into development policies and strategies. I would like to mention that the uh, participants who have any question, please uh, write it in the chat box so that we can read it out in the end of the session. So we'll take these questions at the end of the session. So our first speaker is Mr. Dhiren Shreshtha, uh, Director, State Remote Sensing Application Center, Department of Science and Technology, Government of Sikkim. So he works at, uh, he has uh, like worked in various things like State Action Plan on Climate Change 2011. He has done various projects in collaboration with State Application Center Ahmedabad, NESAC, NRSC and DST Government of India as well as MOEFCC. Development of Glacier Atlas and Wetland Atlas, study of South Lonak Lake in terms of GLOF, study of East Rathong Glacier for long-term monitoring of Himalayan Glacier, Alpine Ecosystem Dynamic Study in Sikkim. So over to you, sir. On uh, He will speak on Sikkim State Climate Action Plan issues and challenges. Over to you, sir. Uh, respected uh, Professor VK Sarma, uh, Senior Professor from IAPL and also a respected uh, Vice Chairman of SSJMA Sikkim, uh, Dr. PK Bhattacharya, Senior Fellow and Associate Director for Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. My fellow colleagues from Sikkim government, government of forest, and other officials from state government departments, and their participants. Uh, I have been uh, given the responsibility to speak on uh, Sikkim state climate action plan issues and challenges. Uh, and I have made one presentation, a brief presentation, uh, before that, I would like to thank Professor Sarma for uh, giving the background. In fact, uh, he has uh, made my uh, presentation easier because he has already uh, given much more than what I had planned. Hello. Okay, I'm trying to share my present. Is it, is it visible to you all? Uh, no, sir, not now. Not yet. Not yet, sir. Not visible. It is not shared yet. Can you open the P? Ah, yes, now it's coming.
Is it okay now? Yes, sir. Yes, it's, it's, yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's a tiny Himalayan state in the northeast with a geographical area of 7,096 square kilometer. And we have diverse flora fauna within uh, this area. And due to varied physiography, the climate ranges from subtropical temperature condition in the southern lower parts to tropical, temperate, alpine, and cold desert climatic condition in snowy north. We have a uh, altitude ranging from almost 200 meters to 8,000 plus meters within the area of 7,096 square kilometer. We have a snow clad peaks. We have large number of glaciers and it is certainly as uh, Professor Sarma has also said, the glaciers are melting and contributing to existing vulnerability and increasing threat of cloth. Would like to share some backgrounds like we have water supply sources, mostly springs and glaciers, and we're getting uh, water from high altitude lakes. We have large number of streams, springs, which has been affected by global phenomena with rapid melting of glaciers. Uh, we also have large area, agricultural area in the state, which is mostly rain fed and is impacted by erratic rainfall as in, as in other cases because we have uh, a very limited area which is which is fed by irrigation system climate change to sustainability of social economic development and livelihood of common communities and environment management and i am i've just shown one uh, uh, sketch here uh, the total sikkim falls within the longitude of 88 to 88 88 to within 88 89 uh, degree east longitude and uh, latitude of ranging from 27 to 28. So within this, we have a state uh, located in the globe. Uh, as said, the Sikkim lies in the eastern Himalaya and is projected to face detrimental impact from climate change, whose impacts are significant on biodiversity, natural resources, and the provision of ecosystem services. We have also analyzed the data from IMD. Uh, from 1915 51 to 2013. And based on data that we have, we have observed is there is an increase on average maximum temperature, uh, especially post monsoon. The post monsoon increase do not give a good, uh, it, it doesn't signify, signifies, uh, it doesn't uh, give us a good signal because post monsoon season for in hill state is a is a period during which our uh, snow snow fell, snowfall areas all these uh, are to uh, consolidate in fact uh, the ice are to be uh, the snow are to be converted into ice and uh, it had to be um, i mean the total glaciated areas would have been increased by then but then uh, since this increase is leading to melting of glaciers even Post monsoon. Uh, we have done in in depth analysis of glaciers of Sikkim. We have been uh, mapping glaciers in the 2000 and, uh, 1990. Uh, we have mapped 84 glaciers based on satellite data, uh, measuring 384. But it has uh, sorry, uh, it has uh, 396 square kilometer, but it has come down to 384 square kilometer within a span of 22 years. So this is a prime minute data that we have within our lab. Similarly, with the support of Space Application Center Ahmedabad, we have been doing, uh, we have been monitoring the lakes of high altitudes in Sikkim. Uh, we had first wetland atlas developed in 2011. Uh, so sorry, we had jointly with Forest Department, we prepared wetland atlas in. 19, 2001 or so, then recently also we have published uh, wetland atlas of Sikkim, wherein we have found that in most of the high altitude lakes, there has been increase. The, the total number of wetland has increased in high altitude, plus total area of aerial extent of high altitude lakes has also increased. Uh, some examples has been shown here. Uh, Professor Sarma has already said about uh, South Lonak Lake. 
In fact, South Lonak Lake is a lake situated in uh, the, at the mouth of the South Lonak Glacier, located in northwest of Sikkim. And it was measuring only around 70 hectares. Uh, it, uh, it was measuring only around 20 hectares in uh, 1970s. But 2011, we measured around 120 hectares. Now it's it's constantly increasing. And because of its increase, and uh, there were some media reporting, uh, even a scientist reporting in current science, that a threat is situated in Sikkim this, uh, of this particular lake because of its uh, increasing uh, size. So we approached DST Gone to India, and with the support of DST Gone to India, there was a uh, working group constituted uh, under the chairmanship of Professor Asukos Ganju from SASE, and the chair committee was uh, uh, supported by members from GSI Lucknow. We have members from uh, ISI Bang ISC Bangalore, we had members from uh, Army, uh, from officials from DST, from SASE. So based on their recommendation, uh, in fact, in-depth study, the bathymetric survey and uh, electrical distributivity survey was undertaken. Then based on that survey, we were asked to uh, ask for two things. What is long-term measures and short-term measures? So short-term measures was on siphoning of lake so initially we did by laying pipelines and all, but despite the laying of pipelines, the, uh, the size of the lake continued continuously increased. Then uh, now with the support of SSDMA, State uh, State Disaster Management Authority, we even widened the mouth of the lake. But despite that, uh, in fact, recently I was discussing with my scientific person within the lab that despite these interventions, the size of the lake has been increasing. It's increasing, it's increasing alarmly. Uh, uh, then uh, we will certainly place this matter to our uh, disaster management authority. Uh, whenever we sit together, we are likely to sit very shortly. So these are the uh, few examples stating that there has been a constant increase in size of the lake and some are posing threat of glacier, a cloth. Uh, and why do we need this action plan? At national level, we have national action plan on climate change, which was launched by uh, Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh in 2008. And uh, based on MOFCC's recommendation, we also developed a state action plan on climate First, state action plan on climate change in 2014. Then national and international climate action policies. Uh, it's being uh, it's it is being evolved since the formation of CFCCs. Paris Agreement has been agreed upon in the year 2015 to limit global mean temperature rise within two degrees and working towards the limit at 1.5 degree. Uh, India has also given our NDCs post-2020 uh, with three major quantifiable goals, which are related to emission reductions, uh, renewable energy. We, uh, we focus on more uh, on renewable uh, and clean energy uh, mostly non-conventional energy, and also uh, to increase carbon sink. So these are the three quantifiable goals that has been highlighted uh, that have reflected. But there are other uh, NDCs. Uh, then India has also pursued major domestic policies and schemes in the areas of climate change mitigation and adaptation actions in fields of clean and renewable energy, as Sarah has already said. Uh, in an enhancement of energy efficiency, uh, development of less carbon intensive and resilient urban development, promotion of waste to health, wealth, uh, electric vehicles, etc. And for all these uh, programs, Government India has also uh, are supporting research, supporting uh, giving subsidies to major industries who would like to work on these areas. Then there is a need for enhanced capacities and improved understanding of sectoral and regional climate variabilities and projections, greenhouse gas emissions, long term vulnerabilities, mapping vulnerable regions, social group, etc., which will help identify and prioritize mitigation adaptation strategies and also refining regional space action plans and strategies. Uh, Substances need to be revised and strengthened further considering the evolving context of climate science policy and actions 
no doubt the science and technology department uh, sikkim uh, had developed science and uh, sikkim had developed sepsis in 2011 uh, we worked started working in 2011 and 14 it was inaugurated by uh, authority in sikkim uh, but to tell this uh, to tell this uh, this gathering fr frankly that the initially people were not aware they were not much aware of climate change uh, climate science and uh, uh, with the support of mfcc we got a support from giz and giz had also deputed some consultants so consultants were the were leading this uh, development of sepsis but no doubt uh, there had been um, a lot of discussion a lot of critical evaluation of sepsis at different forums uh, despite a lot of criticisms, uh, I would say that SEPCC, initial SEPCC had uh, made the foundations to work on, uh, to work on and work on and also to improve in subsequent SEPCCs that we are planning. Uh, then MFCC also uh, requested the states to initiate the process of revision of SEPCC in January 2018. We have been sanctioned around 20 lakhs. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the MFCC and because of COVID, uh, we got delayed, but we are already working on it. Then states, uh, the ministry has also encouraged uh, states to integrate state level variation in ecosystems, geographic conditions, socioeconomic scenario and other factors while converging with the existing policies and ongoing programs and schemes being, being implemented at the state level. Uh, about this, about this, uh, uh, about this revision of sepsis. What are the strategies that we are adopting? Or uh, I should rather say that status of sepsis of Sikkim is, we already had constituted a steering committee on climate change, which is chaired by the chief secretary, uh, and we also had one uh, full fledged meeting under the chairmanship of chief secretary very recently. Uh, for revision of sepsis. Uh, the sectoral vulnerability assessment has been carried out for five sectors uh, forest health gender socioeconomic agriculture and disaster climate profiling and drivers of vulnerability have been identified that supports the adaptation and mitigation plans working group co-group committee from key sectors has also been constituted for sectoral input in fact, for revision of state action plan on climate change, we are getting support from IIT Guwahati. Uh, Professor Anamika Barwa and her team has helped us for vulnerability assessment, especially the sectoral vulnerability assessment that is mentioned here. We have also approached to IIT Gandhinagar for climate profiling and climate projections, which shall be the which shall be the basic ingredients upon which we shall be working on. Uh, for development of revision of state action plan on climate change. Uh, meeting of uh, this is a picture showing that the first meeting of steering committee chaired by chief secretary. We have additional chief secretary. We had officials from forest department and all uh, land departments from government Sikkim. Um, the major changes that we plan to have in the revised CFCC that in previous uh, CFCC. Uh, the vulnerability assessment was mostly a socio-economic vulnerability assessment. Uh, and this in the revised one, as I've said, we are also working on sectoral vulnerability. And also we would be including even biophysical indicators, which shall be uh, detrimental for vulnerability assessment. Then methodology framework for vulnerability assessment was based on the guidelines of the fifth assessment report of IPCC 2014. Since FCC is intended to have key priorities of different sectors in terms of climate change adaptation and mitigations. Climate profiling and projections is being integrated in the revised CFCC. In previous version of state action plan on climate change, for some of the sectors, budget, budget were highlighted. And while preparing, preparing and after the completion of state action plan on climate change, people had high hopes. That whatever plan has been reflected, there will be free flow, fund flow from uh, different sources. But that was not the case. So, uh, and people had high expectation that when this uh, plan was reflected in CFCC, so obviously there will be uh, free flow of fund. 
but that is not the case. Therefore, um, in in the present in the revised subsidy, what we plan to do is. We plan to mainstream the climate finance possible conveyance for the most priority sectors uh, in revised CFCC. So, uh, in fact, CFCC is not, uh, we shall not be a document for um, getting free flow of fund, but it should be rather, it should be taken by uh, officials as a guiding principle uh, in the state, in the state, which, which, was, which was not the case in the past. Uh, some of the issues and challenges that I have noted is that we have uh, limited and skilled and trained human resource on this issue. There is a limited meteorological observations. Initially, uh, whatever data we have observed from Sikkim, it is from two meteorological stations only. We are certainly working on it. In fact, we are also installing uh, automatic weather, uh, portable automatic weather, weather station in different schools. If possible, in fact, we have already procured around 60 automatic weather stations, and uh, we would like to increase the net network in Sikkim. Uh, there is a lack of basic baseline data. Uh, there is also meager understanding about climate change. Minimal coordination among the departments, policy, regulatory authorities. Need for need of proper integration, convergence, and synergy among technical institutions. Then uh, the main issue is a financial uh, financial issues. Uh, we have, as Sir has said, it is, there is one uh, funding agency called GCF, Green Climate Fund, at the international level. Then in India, we have uh, national and uh, national adaptation fund. But national adaptation fund also there is a limited fund available because we had uh, we got, we got one sanctioned we got one project sanctioned on an FCC, but and. Uh, uh, it was mostly on Dara Pikas and the addressing climate change to uh, water uh, vulnerable areas. So that project is being implemented by RMDT. It is uh, highly appreciated by Ministry of Indian Forest also. Uh, and based on the performance of this uh, uh, project, we even approached Ministry of Indian Forest for a second or third project if possible. But then we are told there is uh, the NFCC fund has also almost it's also exhausted. So there is no uh, separate fund for climate change program in ministries. Uh, the delay in enactment due to inadequate funds leads to cost cost overrun. Yes, uh, this is also an issue that has been faced in different projects. Inadequate finance mapping of sources to implement many of many of large scale adaptation and mitigation measures. Though GCF is there, but GCF uh, uh, it is uh, probably it's a it gives a good fund, a fund, in fact, good grant as well as a loan. Uh, but to, to make a project of that standard, we need a lot of expertise within state. There is also need for interdepartmental synchronization for activities achieving the same goals. Need for multidisciplinary approach involving all stakeholders. There is also need for more capacity building activities in climate adaptation and mitigation. Uh, these are uh, some of the issues that I've highlighted, and if uh, if anybody would like to know more on my presentation, then I'm ready to answer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, we'll now quickly move to the next session because we are running out of time. So I would like to invite Dr. Bharat Kumar Pradhan, a scientific associate, Good Sikkim right State now. Biodiversity Board. Member IUCN community leader, friends for uh, Future International. Uh, sir is a reputed scientist in Sikkim and Northeast India. He is currently holding the post of scientific associate in State Biodiversity Board of Sikkim. Uh, he is also the member of IUCN and a community leader of Friends in Future International, a Germany-based organization. He is an environmental scientist and a biodiversity expert of Himalayan region. He has published several research journals, books and articles on flora and fauna, faunal diversity, on COVID and environment, and on climate action. He is also an environment activist and a role model for motivating youths for climate action. So, over to you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Pallavi, I will be presenting from uh, the NV section only. So, share my.
Sir, now I have given the rights to you. You can try now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, organizer, for. Uh, uh, am, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. It's visible. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, organizer, for making me a part of this uh, important webinar. Uh, since I have been given a uh, responsibility to talk on challenges and complexities of mainstreaming climate change in developmental activities, uh, there are multiple um, factors that is posing uh, challenges um, on mainstreaming climate change uh, in developmental activities, of which I'll be uh, uh, highlighting on a few points. Uh, as we all know that uh, development is necessary for the economic prosperity of the country. And we also know that any developmental activities will have long term impact on the environment. That is why emphasis is given on sustainable development and the United Nations has already set 17 sustainable development goals, which mainly focuses on joint action in biodiversity conservation and curbing climate change for making the planet Earth a peaceful and safer place and to provide sustainable future for its uh, citizens. Um, it is a known fact uh, that climate has been changing. It's a natural phenomenon, but uh, the unsustainable human activities now have accelerated the uh, process of climate change. And uh, now the climate change is threatening sustainable development by threatening critical resource, especially water and increasing the incidences and severity of natural disasters. It is also uh, exacerbating existing economic, political and humanitarian stresses, especially in countries like India, which depend heavily on climate vulnerable sectors such as agriculture, water resources, forest and biodiversity to maintain and improve the living condition of its people. It is therefore important uh, to integrate climate change in development plans and policies, which will make uh, development more resilient by reducing climate impacts. Uh, mainstreaming climate change into policies, plans and development activity, activities uh, contributes to reducing vulnerability to climate impacts and variability, increasing the adaptive capacity of communities and national activities facing climate impacts and ensuring sustainable development and avoiding taking mild adaptive decisions and actions. Yes, climate is changing and climate is impacting each one of us. It is affecting each one of us, but is perceived differently by the different groups of people. For a person with a white collar job, extreme heat or cold means they have options to switch on to AC or heater. And in case of heavy rain, they have options to not to go out. For a politician, climate change means an opportunity to garner funds from the international agencies, financial support from the global financial support. And for a media house, climate change means an opportunity to increase their TRP. And for the corporates, climate change provides a prospect to expand their business. But for a farmer, climate change means no rain when it is required and heavy rain when it is not necessary, resulting in flooding and damaging of the entire crop when it is time to harvest. harvest. For them, climate change means crop infestation by insects and pests. For them, climate change means wastage of their hard work. It is the farmer and the common people who have to face the wrath of the furious nature who are vulnerable to climate change. But ironically, they are hardly involved in, a, in any climate change policy decision making or decision related to developmental activities. The local communities are always kept in dark, revealing only about the positive aspect of any developmental activities. Any policy decisions are influenced by the politicians and the corporates who have got nothing to lose, but lots to gain. Existing policies are molded at the whims and fancies of the corporates and the political leaders. We have never heard a person with a white collar job, a politician or a corporate doing suicide because of the loss incurred due to climate change. 
it is the farmer it is a common man who suicides because he is not able to bear the loss caused due to climate drive driven disasters hence unless the climate change is seen through a common lens unless the stakeholders are engaged in climate risk assessment and unless their capacity is built up and unless they are involved in policy decision making every policy is going to fail mountains today the most vulnerable place on earth is undergoing transformation it is under tremendous pressure due to various ongoing developmental activities such as hydropower development road widening highway extension setting up of industries urbanization smart city development etc nevertheless uh, curbing climate change warrants reducing the emission of greenhouse gases and slow global warming given the urgency of the problem there has been a growing push for alternate energy source to fossil fuels development of hydropower is one of the efficient way to produce electricity with meager greenhouse gas emission emitting 35 to 70% time less greenhouse gases per terawatt hour as compared to thermal power plants realizing the potential of hydroelectricity numerous hydropower projects are commissioned in sikkim and some projects like tista stage 5 with 510 megawatt capacity have already started generating electricity numerous reputed institutions from across india were involved in carrying capacity studies before the initiation of the project they have come out with n number of publications series and volumes of books and and many research scholars have earned phd degree however those studies have failed to make the policy maker understand the long term associated risk in the mountains they have failed to give the required output that is the policy recommendation on soil moisture conservation and water resource management which is very important in mainstreaming climate change into developmental activities here uh, i would like to share about my recent interaction with the local communities in some of the villages where i had gone for awareness program most of the people there has abandoned farming and we had a discussion on reviving this traditional farming system the local communities they said that it is not that they don't want to do farming they are forced to abandon is because they are facing drought like situation in the area one of the reason is their villages are situated just above the tunnel from where all the water is seeping through drying up their springs and other water sources the soil has become extremely dry making once productive farmland to unproductive one the dry and compact soil is not able to hold the rainwater anymore which is lost through surface runoff resulting in washing away of the top soil they further complained that rising temperature and the less rainfall has increased the incidences of forest fire in their area according to them entire area is invaded by drought tolerant species such as promolina odorata which is responsible for forest fire during the dry spell they fear that their village is slowly turning into desert such projects are not only associated with displacement and this uh, desertification but also we are losing our prime agricultural land and pristine forest which are acquired for installation of the high tension transmission line towers as in the picture as in the picture through which the electricity generated is taken to eastern grid in jalpaiguri district of west bengal for distribution it is posing a serious doubt on the future food security as we are losing our traditional crop varieties as well as local biodiversity as i said in the beginning our uh, development is necessary for the economic prosperity however unsustainable development without planning and policy will only bring long term disaster more than more than the economic prosperity forest play a significant role in hydrological cycle and reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide level a major greenhouse gases gas it also act as a sponge that absorbs rain water and taking it down to the aquifer ensuring ensuring the water security however 
the ongoing rampant clearing of forest for road construction, road widening, smart city development, etc., without policy and planning is resulting in loss of biodiversity and disappearance of water sources. Disruption of hydrological cycle, increase in surface runoff, thus increasing the chances of flash floods. Deforestation is also creating urban heat island, affecting the local climatic conditions. This has increased the energy cost, air and dust pollution level, as well as heat and dust related illness, resulting in financial instability in the local populace. In the slide, this uh, this photo was very, uh, very recently taken. Uh, it was taken on 15th March 2022 from my house, uh, and the time was it was taken at 8 3 a.m. in the morning. Here you can see the impact of the urban heat island. Now we are here for the first time. It is just near to four or five kilometer far, um, away from Gangtok town. It's called uh, Luing. Here for the first time in last 20 years we have witnessed the forest fire. Now so which means that climate is changing. It is um, uh, impacting the local climate. And during that time, if you see the temperature from uh, 6 a.m. to 12 uh, p.m., the highest temperature had reached on that particular uh, day was 28 degree and low, it, uh, low temperature was 14 degrees C. See, now the visibility has um, uh, reduced in Gangtok area. This photo was taken day before, day before yesterday at 5.30 p.m. And during that, um, if you see the temperature from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m., the high temperature had reached 29 degrees C and the lowest was recorded 27 degrees C. So, uh, so climate is changing and it is impacting every one of us. Now, natural resource forest water ecosystem, um, such as inland streams and rivers, play a significant role in global carbon cycle through their high rates of carbon respiration and sequestration. Moreover, bodies of fresh water also bury carbon in sediments. Rivers also move vast amount of carbon from land to ocean, acting as carbon's busy transit. However, indiscriminate exploitation of river resources like sand and boulders is disrupting the water flow and global carbon cycle, thus emitting carbon buried under the sediment, ultimately impacting the local climatic condition. Further, the leaders are overlooking the commitment on the part of the government to protect the life below water, thus negatively contributing to sustainable development goal 14. Natural resource management is very important for mainstreaming climate change adaptation into development, but their inadequate understanding that the natural resources are not to be last forever and that Developmental activities affects the local climate and the climate change affects the developmental activities is posing a great challenge in mainstreaming climate change in developmental activities. Plastic pollution is a major challenge that the world is facing today. It contributes to climate change because uh, it, it releases greenhouse gases as it slowly breaks down. In order to deal with the plastic pollution, Sikkim government recently took a bold step in banning the production and sale of bottled water, two liters and below capacity from 1st January 2022, thus making an action on, thus taking an action on climate change, thus fulfilling the commitment of India under Paris Agreement. However, the government received major criticism for taking such a decision. Instead of taking the accountability, the companies came out with bottled water of 2.1, 2.2 liter capacity. Additionally, Bisleri Private Limited challenged the decision of the Sikkim government in the High Court. According to them, such bad impacted their business. But what about the impact of plastic bottles on environment? Who will take accountability? Is it them, or is it the government, or is it the consumer? There are many such questions which are yet to be answered, and I believe that it will, it will have no answer. To sum up, the factors that pose challenge in mainstreaming climate change in development activities are non-involvement of local communities in policy decision making. Even if they are involved, their suggestions are never considered. The policy decisions are influenced by the corporates and the political leaders. Biasness in the research studies when it has to do with the developmental projects funded by the government. Inadequate understanding on the part of the government on the impact of the development on climate and the impact of climate change on development. Non cooperation from the corporate sector. So, if we really want to mainstream 
climate change in the developmental activities, then we need to take holistic approach by involving the stakeholders at all the level in decision making. Make sincere effort in implementing the existing policies, emphasize on sustainable development in letter and spirit, and stop taking maladaptive decisions and actions under the influence of the corporates. Otherwise, challenges will always lie in front of us in mainstreaming climate change in developmental activities. Thank you. With this word, I would like to end my presentation here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pradhan. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Ms. Suruchi Bhadwal, Senior Fellow and Director, Earth Science and Climate Change Division, Terry. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Pallavi. I'm just trying to get my slide on. There's a problem with the version in terms of yeah, Josie, can you please help? Yeah, uh, 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 hello. Hello. Yeah, the name of Do you have any perspective? Given the rights to you, you feel me saying. Actually, it's asking me for something. I'm trying to upload, share, and okay, now I can see it. Now I can see it. So it wasn't there before. Yeah, it's okay. coming now. Yeah. 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 I hope it's visible. Can um, you see the slide? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We can see. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to present. Uh, I think what I was hearing from the other speakers was a rich set of presentation, uh, which are contextualized uh, uh, to Sikkim in terms of the findings. And therefore, if I look at what I have as slides, I think a lot of ground has already been covered by the previous speakers, but still, uh, given that uh, uh, my contributions have been uh, in terms of uh, the development of the science on climate change uh, being a part of the IPCC uh, and a lead author, uh, uh, starting from right uh, from the AR4 process of the IPCC to the AR6. Uh, what I bring to you is the larger context in which basically we're looking at uh, climate concerns and the need to mainstream climate action into state policy and planning. Uh, the focus of my presentation is basically it's very important when we talk about climate action and mainstreaming it into state policy and planning is to understand the context in which we are talking about this planning and the need for integration into the uh, uh, policy and plans. Uh, uh, the reason uh, uh, which is because uh, I, you know, frankly speaking, as a person who's been working in the climate field for a long time, I do not think while there are synergies with development uh, activities, uh, uh, policy and planning, I do not think that climate actions are fully synergistic with development policy and planning. So there is a difference and therefore the additionality component needs to be well understood before we talk about integration into the policy and uh, uh, planning frameworks. Uh, uh, so to be able to uh, set the context, uh, it's very important for uh, states, uh, nations, uh, regions to uh, have a, a good understanding of what are we talking about when we are talking about climate change. Uh, 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 there are different definitions that are out there that uh, uh, scientists, uh, uh, different sets of stakeholders have been using and, uh, you know, uh, placing it in context while planning climate action. Uh, uh, first and foremost is a priority to understand the difference between when we talk about weather, uh, the climate and climate change. 
And of course, uh, this is something we do start off with, with any of our stakeholders that we have a discussion with to basically bring home the fact that, you know, when we're talking about day to day with, uh, you know, um, changes in temperatures, rainfall, humidity conditions, that's the weather we are talking about over a longer period of time is the climate of a region that we're talking about and World Meteorological Organization basically specify the period of 30 years to understand the climate of a particular region and a change in in the climate of a particular region over different time spans of 30 years that we observe or more than that is something that we are talking about as climate change and therefore long term weather pattern of a particular region and the changes in it that is being basically reflected from historical periods is what we are terming as climate change. And of course, if you look at the science of climate change and the periods that scientists have been referring to is of course, with regard to pre-industrial times, with regard to the early uh, 19th, uh, the early 20th century and late 20th century, uh, and to see the differences in the 21st century with regard to the climate, with, uh, with regard to the 20th century and the pre-industrial times. So that is how uh, uh, the changes are being observed and being basically reported. The IPCC uh, and the scientists on the climate uh, uh, side are pretty confident about uh, changes that are taking place in the climate. And uh, they, we do have climate skeptics around who basically negate the whole uh, uh, fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the climate has been changing and of course, that it would continue to change in future uh, time periods. And therefore, this is an area that one needs to focus on in terms of looking at uh, how you are likely to get impacted. But scientists are pretty confident about what they are saying. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are, you know, uh, are sure about the nature of the changes because the 20th century, so this is not models that are basically giving you numbers, but what we've observed with the data that has been, been collected globally, uh, 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 from different uh, uh, sources, uh, countries, regions, uh, you know, uh, uh, instruments, uh, uh, recording data around the clock, we've observed that there are already changes that have been observed uh, on the Earth system in the 20th century, and the rate of temperatures, rise in temperatures, already been observed to be uh, to a tune of 0.7 degrees centigrade. And if we uh, include some parts of the 21st century, it's more than 0.8 degrees centigrade. Uh, 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 there has been a decrease in the snow cover and the ice extent in many parts of the world. Uh, uh, there's been a net increase in the global sea levels in the past century. And of course, we are observing warmer and warmer decades uh, uh, as we move on. Uh, therefore, uh, the reason to be concerned and look at what are the projections for the 21st century and there are different models uh, that scientists use. Uh, there are global models that are used, there are regional models that are used, and there are results that are downscaled to local levels to basically understand how these changes are going to conspire at the local levels uh, by uh, a means of which, you know, again, scientists basically confidently indicate that these changes would continue in the 21st century. We are going to see increases in temperatures to uh, uh, a certain uh, rate, depending on the, uh, uh, the emissions of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We're going to continue to see rise in sea levels. We're going to continue to see decline in snow cover and sea ice extinct. And of course, this has huge implications on the entire climate system and, uh, and including the hydrological system. Uh, these are the changes globally that are being talked about in terms of temperatures and uh, rainfall changes. Uh, uh, and of course, when we are talking about changes in temperatures, rainfall uh, patterns, a whole lot of other changes in the climate system are uh, likely because a lot depends on how your temperatures are increasing, uh, your humidity levels are going to change, your evapotranspiration rates are going to change, your soil moisture conditions are going to change, and everything is interlinked. The whole dam system is interlinked, and therefore one change at one end is going to trigger a change, in, a whole lot of change in the entire system. And therefore, while all these other parameters which are interlinked will also change, we're expecting more extremes to you know, take place in the form of, uh, of uh, drought conditions that may get created in certain places and flood-like situations and heavy precipitation incidences in other cases. And therefore, uh, uh, so it's just not about a rise in temperature or a sea level or, you know, uh, or, you know rainfall 
changing in a certain way, it's going to basically result in changes in a whole lot of other parameters and extremes that are of concern for many, uh, 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 many regions. Uh, they are different. So when we predict for the future, it's like astrology. Uh, and, and of course, many of my speakers were very specific in terms of the nature of changes we're talking about and how, what kind of changes we're likely to experience. Uh, the different scenarios that scientists normally run to basically understand the future. It's like astrology or predicting the future based on certain assumptions. Now, the blue line basically indicates if you are following a greener path, a cleaner path, uh, the rate of change may be less in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the emissions in the atmosphere of greenhouse gases, and therefore the changes in temperature may be less. And the ensuing conditions in terms of changes in rainfall patterns, changes in uh, uh, humidity levels, in uh, changes in evapotranspiration rate, soil moisture conditions, et cetera, may be less. The red line basically says that you are still following a fossil fuel intensive path, and therefore the emissions are going to be higher, the greenhouse gas emission concentrations uh, and ensuing concentrations are going to be higher, and therefore you are on a, a more extreme scenario uh, where you, uh, you have a higher rate of change in terms of the temperatures and uh, related parameters and therefore the rate of climate change is going to be far more severe compared to the lower path that is followed. Now it is a choice that the world has whether you are following a blue path or a red path or you're somewhere between the blue and the red path that you may want to basically lie. Uh, it's a collective global decision on the trajectory you would choose and where you would lie in terms of the changes, the climate, the rate at which uh, the changes are likely to happen. Uh, uh, no part of the world is going to be left untouched, including India and uh, uh, the states within India in terms of the changes that will be experienced. And therefore, uh, uh, this becomes a reason of concern to each country and all. And, uh, and of course, being a developing country and the challenges that we face due to development, prima facie, uh, climate change uh, basically introduces an additional challenge that we have to deal with. Uh, uh, we do uh, uh, basically uh, make this statement that there's a large bandwidth we're talking about from the low scenario to the high scenario, and we can lie at any end of the spectrum. We, if we follow a greener path collectively as a world, we may be at the low end of the spectrum. If we follow a fossil fuel intensive uh, path, we may be at the high end of the spectrum. We do so. It's a very uh, uh, a large. Uh, you know, uh, bandwidth uh, and where you may lie in terms of changes in the climate. And therefore, climate change introduces huge unknowns. You don't know whether you would be at the low end of the spectrum of, or the high end of the spectrum. But does that mean that we should restrain ourselves from planning for uh, uh, planning for the changes in the climate that are likely? The answer is no, because what scientists basically say that climate change is likely to trigger large scale changes in the earth system and the consequences are going to be huge. And therefore, uh, because of the huge uncertainty that lies in terms of where the future may unfold, whether at the low end of the spectrum or, or the high end of the spectrum, you cannot ignore the, uh, uh, the possibility of the changes. And therefore you need to integrate and mainstream climate action into your planning policy and planning to be able to uh, to be able to better respond, you know, in case you face the challenges that are being talked about. Uh, uh, even if today the world decides, and uh, to, frankly speaking, we are not in a consensus, globally speaking, in terms of what, where we should be and what we should achieve to be able to contain the rate of changes we are talking about, even if today the world decides that we will emit zero amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, we have already perturbed the system with our past emissions and concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for more than 100 years now. Why? Because the system takes, it doesn't, you, it's not that you're putting the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and the temperatures are rising consistent, you know, uh, uh, parallelly. Uh, the system takes time to absorb, react, and respond. And therefore, whatever emissions have happened and concentration has risen in the last 150 years, 200 years, 
we have already perturbed the climate system for the future for the next 100, 150 years. So even if we decide today there's zero emissions, we the next 100, 150 years, the Earth system is still going to experience the changes and it will be a slow process for the Earth to come back to state stage zero where it was during the pre-industrial times in terms of the kind of climate it, it used to experience. Uh, the, the gases in the atmosphere which are released, the greenhouse gases that we were talking about, have different lifetimes. Carbon dioxide easily stays in the atmosphere for more than 100 years, 150 years, and there are many gases which stay for uh, 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 you know, thousands of years, the hydrochlorofluorocarbons, methane has a lifetime of around uh, 12 years, nitrous oxide around 100 to 110 years, and therefore we've already perturbed the gas, one unit of gas released into the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere for that period of time. Uh, and, and with the release of that gas in the atmosphere today or in the past, we've already perturbed the system for those 100, 110 years, 12 years, given the lifetime of the gas that has been released into the atmosphere. So that's the reason we say, even if we, we, we decide to emit zero units of greenhouse gases, we've already perturbed the system and at least our generation and the next generation uh, 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 that is uh, likely to come will be experiencing these changes, even if we were to take harsh decisions of, of containing the rate of uh, release of greenhouse gases. Of course, this means everything under the sun is going to change, and my previous speakers have very effectively highlighted that. The impacts are going to be felt on anything and everything. The entire climate system is going to get affected, so your entire uh, natural and human systems that are out there is going to get affected. Everything under the sun is going to get affected. So agriculture, water resources, coastal areas, forests and biodiversity, and health, uh, our, uh, our core sectors, infrastructure, we uh, heard, uh, you know, the previous speaker talk about it. Uh, uh, all these areas are going to get affected. Looking at the Indo-Vengetic Plains and Sikkim is very much included as part of this uh, assessment that Terry was involved in as part of an IDRC sponsored study for the last, uh, I think it was done in the uh, 2013 to 2019 period that these assessments were uh, basically arrived at looking at the recent IPCC scenarios, we see that the rate of change of temperatures are going to be, uh, if we are on the low end of the uh, spectrum scenario, it will be to the tune of 2 degrees centigrade to 2.5 degrees centigrade. But if we are at the high end of the spectrum, which is what we are heading towards today, it's going to be more than 4 to 5 degrees centigrade in many parts. And, in, and, and parts of Sikkim, it's going to be easily somewhere around 4 degrees centigrade. Uh, rate of change in precipitation, uh, we're going to experience in India a rise in precipitation uh, uh, in the uh, coming decades. Uh, uh, we, we are going to ex experience easily a rise of 20 to 30 percent precipitation in many parts of the country, including the indo gangetic Plains and in Sikkim. Uh, 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 this is basically extreme precipitation change, 95th percentile. There's going to be some heavy precipitation we're going to see in the Indus. Uh, 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 compared to the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, but overall there's a net increase in the precipitation, but extreme precipitation cases are far more in case of, uh, uh, in case of uh, the Indus compared to the Ganga and the Brahmaputra. And Sikkim is basically going to experience also an increase. Uh, whether the increase is in the form of heavy precipitation incidences or in terms of creating flood-like situations, in certain areas is something that needs to be studied and uh, uh, given uh, further uh, uh, emphasis in terms of research that is carried out in the region. Our findings basically so far say uh, most of the uh, uh, return period of floods that we see, which is basically uh, increasing, is in the Indus catchment to some extent in the Brahmaputra catchment uh, that we see. And uh, ideally to basically understand uh, the local context of these changes and the return periods of these flood events and heavy precipitation in, uh, incidents, uh, more specific studies are required to be carried out. Of course, impacts on agriculture, as said, uh, direct impacts, indirect impacts uh, due to rise in temperatures and CO2 fertilization effects, impacts on pests and diseases, water scarcity, and extreme incidences of droughts and floods are likely to be felt. Uh, the impacts are in the form of yield and production in agriculture that you will basically be observing. And of course, there are substantial decreases uh, estimated for the tropics in terms of cereal production. This is an estimate done by uh, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute for rice, wheat, and mustard, basically talking about declines 
in rice wheat mustard production over India uh, due to change in sensitivity in, uh, of the crops and the varieties that are being grown in India in certain locations. We are already experiencing impacts on agriculture. Uh, uh, apple in Himachal, these are incidences being reported by media in terms of how production losses are being experienced uh, by way of direct impact of changes in humidity levels, by way of direct impacts of changes in temperatures, winter temperatures that are being observed, and by way of impacts in terms of pest and disease infestation to the crops. A uh, uh, whole lot of uh, uh, impact on the economy, uh, uh, therefore, and impacts on local communities, farmers and farming communities who are dependent on the sector for their livelihoods. Therefore, I think it's very important. It, it directly links with development, development objectives, and, and of, of course, social development as well, uh, and, and, and therefore <coughs> becomes crucial for for nations and states to plan for uh, plan to make sure that there are corrective measures that can be taken into account to adapt to the uh, to the ensuing ch challenges that we're talking about in different sectors. Of course, this is basically talking about how this may put many people, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 at risk in terms of access to food, food security issues, and create issues of livelihood sustenance, job security, and social equity inequities and aggravate poverty conditions. Impacts on hydrology, of course, there's going to be an impact on glacial melt. Uh, uh, on glaciers with rising temperatures, different glaciers respond in different ways, depends on the stability at which the glacier is, uh, and therefore not, so, so while temperatures are rising, there will be an impact on glaciers, but, but, the, but the rate at which the glacier get, would get impacted would depend on the stability of the glacier. Uh, 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 at the end of the day, if the rate of change would continue, the temperatures would continue to increase. Almost all glaciers are likely to get affected. The Hindu Kush Himalayan region has some 14,000 plus glaciers, uh, and each of these glaciers are affected differentially. Uh, in today's date and time, uh, 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 the melt may increase in the beginning, uh, uh, but with the size of the glacier reducing, uh, uh, the uh, total glacial melt may reduce and therefore affect the overall runoff rates and river systems therefore affecting uh, water availability uh, uh, in the downstream regions. Uh, uh, so, so therefore impact on water resources is a great, uh, great area of concern. Uh, uh, incidences of flooding, flash floods, uh, and impact on recharge of groundwater aquifers is, uh, is another area of concern that we talk about. Of course, we're talking about impacts on health, uh, direct impacts on health because of extreme events like floods, storms, heat wave conditions that may get created, but indirect effects uh, through the distribution and transmission intensity of infectious diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases, uh, 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 water-borne diseases, water-related diseases uh, that we're talking about. And, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, there are studies that are carried out to understand the heat wave conditions. Uh, we heard our previous speaker talk about urban heat island effect. Uh, so uh, the urban heat island effect is independent of the uh, heat wave conditions that are getting created during uh, uh, peak summers in certain locations in the country, which are causing mortality and therefore combined study of looking at urban heat island effect, plus the climate impacts that we're talking about with regard to changes in the temperature patterns in the different scenarios are, is needed to be able to target and see what kind of impacts are getting created to look for corrective measures. There are studies which look at transmission windows of vector borne diseases and how that has been changing in the country. This is an example for Maharashtra. Uh, there are heat and discomfort, discomfort in the, in the indexes which are developed basically to study how humidity and temperature patterns are likely to make, uh, 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 make heat wave conditions uh, more prominent and, and therefore have an impact on human discomfort and health conditions. So there are studies that are being carried out to understand the different kinds of impacts of climate change. We are involved in many, many studies with regard to uh, uh, both at the subnational scale and the national scale, uh, 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 working with uh, the uh, center and state governments to help understand and localize the impacts uh, uh, better to understand the risks to be able to frame responses. Now, understanding the risk is quite important to know, uh, to know what kind of responses basically need to be framed 
because these are not business as usual development responses that we are interested in as Terry, but to know what is the climate risk that basically we are uh, we are likely to experience in a particular location to which responses need to be targeted. Uh, therefore, there are only two ways in which one can respond. One is to adapt to the consequences of the climate change that uh, to the risk that we're talking about of climate change that is likely. The other is basically uh, also take some measures on the mitigation side. While India is a developing country and our focus has to be adaptation, I think we also need to focus on the mitigation side because while we are not uh, we are not uh, supposed to be basically, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, focusing a lot on the mitigation side, but whatever contributions we do on the mitigation side may help the mitigation ag agenda globally because we are a large developing country and, and we do have high rates of emissions of greenhouse gases uh, with the development uh, trajectory that we are following. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, therefore, we do need to basically focus on the mitigation side as well. Now, what do we, uh, uh, you know, how, how do we plan for adapt adaptation basically depends on where you are, who you are, and what you need to do about it. So this is basically to say, understanding the local context, the risks pretty well to know what are you basically developing the actions for. Of course, adaptations basically anticipatory nature and reactive. So there are people who respond before any planned way of adaptation is also introduced in a particular region. So by anticipating changes, by looking at changes that have been, uh, you know, experienced in a particular location over a period of time, people have been adapting uh, at their own end in certain ways. Uh, that's more anticipatory in nature. Uh, 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 that's more reactive in nature. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, a more planned way of uh, adapting where basically you, underst you understand the nature of changes through the various uh, uh, you know, projections, predictions that are being talked about in the climate in a particular location and then plan, uh, introduce uh, measures for adapting to those changes based on that. So it could be through public policy planning, it, it could be through other ways of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, planning. Uh, there are huge uh, benefits in terms of planning for adaptation at the upfront and basically shows how the losses are basically reduced. This is just an example to say that there's huge potential that adaptation holds uh, uh, if, if measures are targeted towards the risks that are likely in a particular location to reduce the losses related to that uh, particular risk and also protect uh, uh, people on the other hand. Uh, this is basically to say that you may require when you're planning for adaptation, it's not just a sectoral approach that uh, you can take forward for planning for adaptation. You may require a sectoral, you may require a cross-sectoral focus while planning for these uh, uh, for these interventions. You may require a mix of measures to be able to, uh, to reach a particular goal of adaptation. It may be existing measures and integrating actions within the existing measures, scope of existing measures that are there or you may need to introduce new measures altogether to be able to respond to that particular risk. You may want to, if it is too much integrated, you may want to give it a thematic focus in terms of the nature of implementation for adaptation that you may want to take forward. And of course, there are cross-cutting issues on gender and inclusivity and adaptation that are being discussed, but possibly the role of women who are the beholders of natural resources in many cases that we find in rural areas also needs to be explored and their, and their capacities need to be strengthened to be able to better respond in certain cases. Uh, migration is another issue which is being looked at as a cross-cutting area that is emerging in many parts. And therefore, one needs to have a thorough understanding on the, on the uh, uh, patterns of migration and the ancient conditions that are causing uh, uh, the migration to be able to better respond to migration, whether it is an impact of climate change or to look at it as an adaptation strategy where it's helping people and communities adapt to extreme conditions. Uh, uh, we are a large contributor to uh, GAG emissions ourselves. India contributes largely. Energy sector is contributing a huge share of 73%. And uh, most of the emissions is carbon dioxide, but we, you know, knowing that the global warming potential of nitrous oxide, methane, et cetera, and other gases are higher, we are we see a larger share of emissions on of those gases as well and the potential for them to warm the climate up. 
this is basically from 1994, looking at 2010, how India has contributed to emissions, and we have increased in terms of our shares of emissions in every possible sector from which emissions are being accounted for, internationally speaking. Uh, uh, this is basically uh, talking about uh, the uh, distribution of the GHG emissions across different categories. BC electricity production has a largest share in terms of the contributions uh, <laughs> because we're still kind of reliant to a large degree on traditional fuels for generation of electricity. And therefore, there are huge uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, uh, so we look at it as an opportunity for us to move towards cleaner forms of energy and production on the mitigation side. And therefore, India has a lot to do both on the mitigation and adaptation side where it needs to focus. Uh, India's response uh, uh, to uh, uh, climate concerns at the national level, of course, we have the BIRD reports that are getting developed, the NATCOM reports that are getting reported. Uh, we uh, we have uh, uh, set up the International Solar Alliance. We have the CDRI, which has been set up basically looking at, uh, 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 you know, uh, infrastructure and the need for making infrastructure more resilient to uh, 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 climate and disaster risks. Uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, India is signatory to the Paris Agreement and, and the various articles laid within the Paris Agreement. At the subnational scales, we have our state action plans, which are under revision right now. It had been developed early on 10 years back, 10 to 12 years back. Uh, we are revising the state action plans. And, and uh, uh, I think the effort would basically be to see how the state action plans and actions outlined within them uh, are implemented by the states to make sure that you know, uh, uh, states are well prepared uh, for to start with for adaptation, but also uh, uh, wherever, wherever there are synergies with mitigation to see uh, and report from the states on uh, their efforts towards mitigation as well. India has submitted its NDC. Uh, it may be in the process it, uh, it, of re revising its NDCs. The Prime Minister made some ambitious uh, uh, commitments in the Glasgow one COP uh, last year, <laughs> and therefore uh, uh, most of the uh, commitments were in the line of uh, mitigation targets. But of course, there was mention of adaptation in terms of looking at uh, uh, global, uh, uh, global for local action, global uh, support for local action. And I think that basically hints for support for adaptation. Uh, uh, so ideally, India, I think, would focus both on adaptation and mitigation and see how we can basically take both the agendas forward. This is basically aligning uh, the NDCs and the SDGs. Uh, a previous speaker did mention uh, uh, there is uh, an SDG goal on climate, but but if you look at uh, where does climate configure in the SDGs, it configures in almost every SDG that we have out there, whether we talk about zero hunger, whether we talk about food security, whether we talk about land resources. So the though there is a specific SDG on climate actions, I think the climate agenda basically overlaps every uh, you know uh, SDG goal that is out there. And therefore, the synergies between SDGs and NDCs need to be well understood. Uh, uh, this is basically India reporting back on states and states' performance in terms of SDG index. But ideally, what we need is a map where we synergize SDGs, NDCs, and state actions on climate with the SDGs and have a com combined reporting process. Uh, uh, this is basically to summarize that we have national level actions on climate that are in place. We have subnational actions that we are you know, seeing the states basically contribute in various ways. And on the other hand, we also have businesses and industries contributing in different ways. We have a national policy in place with different missions that are out there. We have state policies in place. We, we are looking at co-benefits through existing policies and programs. And we are looking at uh, existing policies and uh, programs in terms of their contributions to sustainable development and synergies with climate action. Now, all of this, how, how do you bring all of this together is the whole challenge when we talk about mainstreaming climate and disaster risks into state policy and planning. And a study done by Terry for the World Bank for the state of Uttarakhand basically was with the objective of mainstreaming this agenda into state policy and planning. The, the starting point was basically to look at what does the state already have in terms of state policy and planning across different sectors to start with where are the gaps and and 
does uh, does the change in the climate pose a certain risk in that particular area or sector of work uh, uh, that uh, that the state is uh, 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 that is the, the, the state is following? And if yes, then identifying those gaps and basically uh, uh, suggesting measures, interventions with regard to filling those gaps up to mainstream the agenda of climate and disaster risk into state policy and planning. Uh, uh, now, there was a previous speaker. The reason to do something like this is uh, uh, going back to a point made by a previous speaker. Where is the finance for taking these actions forward and interventions in where, you know, forward? Uh, in many cases, so the Green Climate Fund Adaptation Fund, you know, you may get uh, access to funding for one or the other projects. You may be able to take that forward, implement it over a period of time. But the kind of risk we are talking about cannot be addressed in this manner. You have to mainstream it into your policy and planning. So your starting point is not the Green Climate Fund or the Adaptation Fund and what projects you can get from there. Your starting point, every state has to do an in-house exercise of understanding your policy programs, how your sectors are going to get affected, and what do you already have as policies and programs to review them to see if they have the potential to contribute to address the climate risks that we are talking about. If they do have that, well and good. And if they don't have that, then we need to see what the gaps are and then what additional uh, uh, things need to be done or measures need to be addressed to be able to mainstream climate and disaster concerns into the state policy and planning. And the budgets are right there with you within your states in the state budget planning within those sectors. So that is the kind of planning we need to integrate it so that we do not have to look for the budgets outside, but we integrate it within. And if there are new measures that are being talked about and additional or you know scaling up that is being talked about, that is the additional budget that we should be talking about is required to promote climate action and mainstreaming and integration into state policy and planning. And, and that is what needs to be done. And that homework has still not been done by many states. Uh, and I think the starting point has to be there uh, because at the end of the day, there's no point producing a state action plan or a national action plan or a mission on X, Y, Z by not knowing where the finances are going to come from because you will reach a dead end and you will basically then basically be looking for resources on how to take the thing forward. I think the, the, we, our starting point has to be different to see what we already have and, and then talk about the, the additionality part of it in the end not basically talk about the whole area and the interventions, what needs to be done and where the finance is going to come. So I think the mainstreaming process has to start differently from, uh, the, you know, uh, from the other way around where we talk about what we already have and then what is basically needed. And with that, I close this, my presentation and I do hope that we do get the opportunity to interact with Sikkim also to, to talk about mainstreaming actions, uh, climate and disaster risk into state policy and planning. Uh, uh, from the point of view of looking at how state action plans on climate change that have been outlined, uh, do not wait for uh, implementation till finance is made available, but to see how that can be mainstreamed into your existing policy frameworks to be able to already initiate and start action on climate risks. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we'll now quickly uh, uh, move to the interactive session and summing up. So I would like to request Dr. P.K. Bhattacharya, Senior Fellow Associate Director and NVIS Coordinator, Terry, to kindly um, sum up the whole technical session. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Pallavi. And uh, first of all, it's congratulations to all speakers who have taken part right from the beginning where you know, um, we, we could learn that how ministry has initiated our NVIS program and then you know, uh, Dr. Sharma categorically you know, highlighted how exactly Sikkim disaster management planning and policy formulations are happening, showing several case studies and highlighting the you know, activities and kind of you know, um, actions they have already taken are planning to take. So that was our, you know, main takeaway from the uh, session in the, you know, um, in, the, in the inaugural session, you can say. So I thank all of our speaker in the technical session 
So it began with, uh, uh, you know, Hiranji. Um, um, so who basically is a director, Department of Science and Technology, Government of Sikkim. So who highlighted that, you know, there are, you know, SAPCC already in place and, you know, there are some revised changes and revisions are happening and several issues and challenges is highlighted, which actually calls for more finance, infrastructure development, and, you know, regulatory or policy process uh, formulation, coordination between different government departments and, of course, capacity development. But, you know, Bharat Kumarji, um, uh, Pradhanji, who is Scientific Associate Biodiversity Board and also member of IUCN and com a community leader, he basically pointed out impact of climate change in mostly felt by the common people. However, they are not being part of the decision making and uh, or other policy formulation process. So how that can be ensured. So that is one, you know, queries he has already raised. Mountain systems are very fragile and there are several, you know, uh, instances he has shown, including forest fire, loss of food, uh, livelihood um, and livelihood, uh, then mining, and that, uh, you know, generation of uh, thermal power, uh, electricity from thermal power plants actually endangering the species as well as the entire ecosystem there. So those are few areas which he has pointed also, you know, touched upon the plastic pollution and how that has a, you know, far reaching role. And uh, finally, you know, our uh, director of climate change, uh, Mrs. Uh, Suruchi Vadwal, Dr. Suruchi Vadwal actually, very lucidly, uh, you know, pointed out the impact of climate change on is is a real threat to environment, indicating that you know there are several parameters are linked, and one parameter change actually will increase the you know uh, many such uh, you know uh, systems, natural systems, and as well as you know the coordinated approach is required context of policy and planning in the in terms of mitigating and the adaptation of climate change activities needs to be a uh, real you know um, plus point for our uh, this discussion he she also actually you know highlighted that how exactly you know mainstreaming can be done in a stepwise manner and also suggested that only financing uh, may, maybe you know uh, the States can think of how policies are to be, you know, uh, linked with their existing policy, and then the remaining part can be, you know, taken up for financing or rather discussion, so that you know all activities can be held together. Now, uh, this was, you know, the summary of today's discussion. The uh, I, I, I congratulate all of our speakers. But there is one specific question which has been raised by one of our speaker, uh, you know, participant, which I am posing before the uh, this esteemed panel, that you know, lot has been said on that you know we need to have policies and all everything. But is there any example that where policies are successfully you know stra strategizes the, the you know climate change mitigation or adaptation you know issues? Is there any example? Can any one of you, you know, um, give us? So this is a open question to all of our, you know, um, esteemed speakers. So I didn't get the question. So they're asking us that uh, is there an example? Is there any of example where climate change strategies are now? successfully you know built into a policy in any state or in maybe a national level so, or so, maybe in so other parts. we have a national action plan on climate change of which we have the uh, jawala nehru uh, uh, mission on solar uh, as and as part of the mission on solar uh, there are a lot of uh, measures that are already being implemented in different parts of the country in different states so with plans to implement solar photo photovoltaics, for example, uh, um, so massive scale for lighting, PV lighting purposes, I think there is implementation that is already being done through that particular mission. 
the promotion of electric vehicles, for example, uh, and incentivizing uh, promotion of electric vehicles by the government is another policy scheme uh, area where the government is trying to promote the use of cleaner uh, 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 vehicles, uh, which may emit so so maybe the the emission levels would be less compared to the traditional uh, vehicles that are being used where oil is being burned or diesel is being burned. So there are many examples. This is more on the mitigation side. Uh, uh, there are policies and schemes, uh, you know, uh, for the adaptation side, basically. Uh, so you have the National Adaptation Fund on Climate Change that the government has now. And if you look at, if you go to, uh, if you type NAFCC in the website and try to look at projects that the government is doing in different states, almost every state has a national adaptation project uh, funded through the NAFCC. Uh, different states have different priorities. So, say for example, I know Orissa is focusing on recharge and water conservation efforts under its adaptation uh, priority. Uh, Puducherry is working, focusing on water conservation. Uh, uh, there is uh, Telangana, which is focusing on promoting resilient agriculture. Uh, so different states have prioritized different sectors and uh, uh, different areas uh, for uh, implementing adaptation uh, on the ground. But these are all on a pilot mode and you know uh, supported on a project uh, board. Uh, and what uh, I was the point that you also highlighted. I was trying to say by pilots and projects are fine. At the end of the day, the scales at which we're talking about the changes to be introduced are quite massive. And uh, uh, while this may help in terms of showing uh, piloting, showing what works, what doesn't work, and demonstrating technologies and practices, etc., the pilots and the pro projects, at the end of the day, integration and mainstreaming in policy and planning for implementation is the need. Whether for mitigation or for adaptation. Okay. Thank you, uh, Suruchi ji. And uh, is there any other comments on this? Because this was the only question raised, and I'm sure that you know many of our participants will have questions. We will keep this entire video recorded in YouTube channel so that you can have a look and also post questions to um, uh, either to Envis in, uh, Hub in Sikkim or to Terry Envis so that we can you know, get those answers from the um, uh, respective speakers and, you know, share it with you. So, since there is no such questions, so I'm handing over to Pallavi for, you know, uh, ending the this seminar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, participants. Uh, there is a request from the participants that they want the... Uh, uh, presentations of the speakers. So I have shared my email ID in the chat box. So I would request all the uh, speakers to please share their presentations so that we can send it to the participants for their further reference. So thank you all. Thank you.